Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. <laughs> For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the true, authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 693 MR966. Lance Corporal John Latimer of the Royal Corps of Signals. It was my lorry, right enough. Signaler Lewis Ruling of the same company. It only hadn't rained that night. Mrs. Elsie Avery, who lost her son. He was a lively lad, but he never done any harm. Miss Hartley, the Colonel's daughter. I was raised in the army, and I know what I see. Superintendent Robert Lester of Scotland Yard. If you will come into the Black Museum here with me, I think Chief Superintendent John Davidson can show you what we started with on this case. Here's quite a collection in here of items that have figured in various cases we've worked on here in Scotland Yard. Some of them successfully, and some of them unsolved to date, shall we say. Come with me, please. Ah, here you are, John. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, who has a long and distinguished record with us. Well, how do you do? Say, I finally found those things, Bob. Ah. I mislaid them, I'm afraid. Now, don't be afraid to look. They're not at all gruesome. Some folks seem to think we have a kind of chamber of horrors here. But I assure you, these things are quite innocuous for the most part. Now, this is the handkerchief. Still quite clean, isn't it? Wasn't always so clean, Bob. See, an ordinary cocky-colored handkerchief, such as millions of soldiers carried during the war. <laughs> I carry one. And this, you don't recognize it? It's a gas mask cover. See the shoulder strap here? Oh, no, soldiers didn't carry this kind. This is red leather, or imitation leather, if you will. It was the type children carried with them. A child did carry this one. You can still see his name inside it here, written in his own kid's handwriting. Philip Ainsley Avery. Philip Avery is dead. But this little red leather bag helped Superintendent Lester start a man on the early morning stroll that ends on the gallows trap. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to be called by the Bucks Constabulary at once on this case. Too many times Scotland Yard is called in only after the local police have exhausted their every resource. But those chaps in Buckinghamshire wanted help at once and badly in this little village in early November 1941. Station superintendent... Uh, no, I'll not tell you his name. Brief me. He tossed the gas mask case, the one you just saw, on the desk. This is all we've found so far. Rather a bright-colored gas mask case for a boy to carry. Uh, how old is he? I don't know whether we should say is or was, Superintendent. Mm. Been looking for him how long now? Three and a half days now. And this is all you found? Aye. I'm scared if he's lost and if he throw away his respirator case. Where'd you find it? About a mile from here, down the road in the ditch. Well-traveled road? Not very. Get anything from his parents? Father's dead, and mother's well as you'd expect. He was the only child. What did she think? Well, first she thought he'd run away. Mm. He was quite dotty over the army, and she thought he'd be hanging around some camp or other in the vicinity. He wasn't. But they all moved out last one a week ago. Oh, except for that convoy that went through here the day after the kid disappeared. Could they have taken him along, a mascot, perhaps? <laughs> Checked him first bloody thing. Not with him? No. Their O.C. telephoned me from somewhere over the East Coast. Nice chap, worried. Said he'd turn out the whole party and no one had heard of the kid. Good man. 
And the countryside is turned out, you said. Not an able-bodied man in the village that isn't out in the country searching. They'll find him, perhaps. That's what I'm afraid of. Yes. Well, where do you want to start? Who saw the boy last? His mother. He was just setting off for school. Hmm. What about her? Well, frankly... Oh. I've seen mothers who treated their kids better. I'd better see her, hadn't I? Killing her kid's awfully nasty, Superintendent. Yeah. He's my sister-in-law. Oh? The brother's wife. I, uh... I thought the kid's name was Avery. When she married Avery after my brother was killed at Calais. Where is Avery? Killed at Tobruk. She must be pretty bitter. Bitter? I'll have a talk with her. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's all right. I was rather fond of my young nephew. Probably why I telephoned you so quickly. Yeah. Thought you said every man in the village was out looking for the boy. They are. Who are all those chaps then coming down the road? Well, they're carrying something. Steady, steady, old boy. It's my sister-in-law. That's it. They found him. In my time, I've seen a good many murdered persons. I shall probably see a good many more before I turn in my warrant card. But this one, an 11-year-old schoolboy. I can still see that great blue bruise on his forehead and his throat. I've got kids myself. His mother, she was quite controlled when I talked with them. You'd better take me in, Superintendent. I did it. How did you do it, Mrs. Avery? It was such a lively boy, but he... He never meant any harm. Everyone says he was a fine boy, Mrs. Avery. I called him a little hellion. He was always talking about the army. And how he was going to join up the minute he came of age. I hate the army. Yes. It's taken Philip's father from me. And Avery. I couldn't bear the thought of losing him to it. I raised my hand to my son. <coughs> he said it was his duty. And I thrashed him so many times, but he was stubborn. Duty, I said. What about your duty to your mother? He was all ready for school. With his little gas mask case, standing in the door. Somebody, he said. Somebody's got to take Daddy's place. Just like a kid talks. Daddy's place. And Mr. Avery's. And I... I slapped his face. I could cut off my hand. And he... He gave me such a look. And went away and I never saw him again until... I sent him to his death. I murdered him. The army got him too. I went away from that stricken woman. What else could I do? She was obviously convinced that she was responsible for the boy's death. But if her story was true, then that was a matter for her own conscience. If it was not, well, if she had killed the boy, there was time enough. The divisional superintendent drove me to the place where the body had been found in his own car. It was a side road off the main highway. Little traveled, and the local constable pointed out the place. I was right there, sir. I marked it with a stick. I was with a searching party. We came across the road here, and Sammy Roberts, he seen that red gas mask bag lying on the edge of the ditch right over there. We picked it up, and we was looking around like, and I spotted the body lying right down there. Lying on his back, he was. Like he was asleep with his little arms folded on his chest. I, I thought he was asleep till I saw the blood. Well, there weren't much of it for the rain. We run over here, and then we saw the mark on his forehead. Dead all right, and quite peaceful, as I said. I 
So, sir. Be no other cars along here since you found them, then? Only one or two, sir. Where did all that oil come from, then? Where, sir? Down there. Oh, I, I don't know, sir. Looks like crankcase oil. The car's been standing there. Some time ago, though. The rain's washed it out, partly. Like it washed away all the fingerprints on the gas mask bag, sir. Certainly looks as if a car or a lorry's been standing here. Could those be its tire marks? Constable, see that no one that comes along here gets near those tire marks. You want to make a plaster cast of them, sir? Yes. Well, Nobby Clark back at the station knows how to make them, sir. He, he was at the police college at Hendon. I'll send him out when we go back. Have you covered everything else, McKinnon? I think so, sir. Rain's washed away everything else, but, but I, I didn't notice these marks. Who's that? Stop him, Constable, before he runs on those tire tracks. Stop! Stop, stop! Please, stop! Who is it, you know? <clears throat> I think it's Miss Hartley. She's got the only NG in this part. Who is she? The daughter of our local retired colonel, Chief oh, Air Raid Warden. to learn about poor Philip Superintendent. He was such a charming boy. What in the world are you doing out here? This is the place where he was found, Miss Hartley. Oh, how dreadful. You have my deepest sympathy, sir. Who's this man? I'm Superintendent Lester of Scotland Yard, madam. Now, don't call me madam. The name's Hartley. Inga Hartley. Lived here for years. My father's Colonel Hartley. Late, late the Green Howards. Been in the army practically all my life. I, What's I, Scotland Yard doing up here? Can't you handle this, Superintendent? Well, I... Oh, no. Your nephew, of course, yes. Sorry. Who's had a lorry up here with a leaking crankcase? We don't... Had a leaking crankcase as far as I can see it. Who was it? The murderer? Oh, Sorry. We've only just come in on this. I saw a lorry over there at the road junction three mornings ago. Army lorry, driven by a lance corporal, driving onto the main road from this road. Oh, was that the day the boy was reported missing, Superintendent? Was, huh? You're sure it was an army lorry, Miss? Hartley. Of course I know it was an army lorry, driven by a young lance corporal wearing steel-rimmed glasses, a 1,500-weight Fordson. I was raised in the army, sir, and I know what I see. Was there any markings on it, Miss Hartley? Of course. It was a Royal Corps of Signals lorry. How did you know? Why, it had the blue and white patch painted on the front like the signaler's armband. A big 56 was lettered on the side in white, and there was a red and green clover leaf painted on the left front door. Yeah, the trucks of that signal convoy that passed through here... Eh? Huh? I remember the markings on them. Cod pits, that's right. What, sir? Yes, what are you talking about? Yeah, they were marked with plain card pips. Some of them with the ace of spades, some with diamonds and hearts and... and... clubs. There's your clover leaf, Miss Hartley. God, stone the bloody crow. Excuse me, that's the murderer. <laughs> As Miss Hartley roared off in her MG, we headed for the village. It was a thin enough clue, but it was the only one, except for the mother's fantastic confession, but we started to investigate it at once. A telegram to the war office. Request most urgent the present location of Royal Corps Signal Unit. We passed through this village three days ago, headed for East Coast Park. Information desired in connection with serious crime. Leicester, Scotland Yard. No use trying to trace him any other way, security regulations and all that. We'll have a reply in no time, I'm sure. But if that signals call corporal did kill him, why? Probably struck him with the lorry and got frightened. But what was Phyllis doing over there? The school's in the opposite direction. Maybe he was running away. Excuse me, sir. Would you like to have a look at the things we took from the boys' pockets? I... Would you mind looking, Lester? If there's anything you think I should see... I'll have a look, Constable. Keep a string, sir. An old cap badge. That was his father, sir. He always carried it with him. Fractions and coppers. Half a packet of peppermints. Mm. Fair breaks your heart, doesn't it, sir? Poor kid. Go on, Constable. Parky handkerchief. Hold, hold, hold. Hold on a minute. Was that his? Can't say, sir. Hold it out, I... I think we'll take a closer look at it. I believe that's oil on it there. It is, sir. Smells like old crankcase oil to me, sir. Hold it out. I'll tell you what to do with it. 
might be quite important. Yes, sir. How's his mother? Took her to a nursing home down the road, sir. She's, uh, I'm afraid she's, you know, not going to get over it. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, is that all? Only this, sir. What? This we found inside the gas mask case, sir. What is it? Looks like the corner of a pound note, sir. All crumpled up. It's a bloody strange place to find a bit of money. How do you suppose he got it? Why, I think, Constable, the important thing to discover is who has the rest of it. The murderer. Oh, hello, Zuba. We've heard from the war office about the signal company. Where are they? Uh, they're at a port of embarkation. Oh. They're due to leave the day after tomorrow for North Africa. <laughs> If we were to follow up what seemed to be a promising clue, in fact, our only clue, there was, of course, no time to lose. But there were things that we must accomplish before we left for the port of embarkation. And these are the things we accomplished with the aid of Scotland Yard technicians who were rushed to us from London. We have the plaster cast of the tire marks on the road, sir. The samples of oil we took out of the murder here, too. They match the oil stains on the khaki handkerchief. The handkerchief has been washed and examined. What appears to be a laundry mark... K-201-537 uh, was discovered on the edge of it. It had been partially obscured by the oil stains. The wound on the boy's throat was inflicted after death, which was caused by the blow on the head, sir. One thing we do not know yet, Superintendent, is where that torn piece of the one-pound note came from. I brought Philip's mother here to tell you about that. It's from Philip's money box. What? I knew at once when the... Su- my brother-in-law told me. I took her home to see. Philip had come back and taken it. I looked in the drawer in his cupboard where he kept it. I found it broken open and empty. I knew what had been in it. Thirty-one shillings in coin. I always gave him a shilling for shining my boots. And the pound note I gave him for his birthday the day before Michaelmas. He'd taken it all to run away on. And they murdered him for thirty-one shillings and a pound note. The army paid me much more for his father. <laughs> I don't think I shall ever forget that. We arrived at the barracks of the signal company at the port of embarkation shortly after Re- Reveille. Major Hugh Scott, the young officer commanding who had been an engineer at Wandsworth, was waiting for us in what he called his orderly room. The men were still at breakfast, but the company sergeant major ushered us in. The gentleman from the police, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, sergeant major. Come in, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, major. Sit down, gentlemen. I'm afraid I don't know what this is all about, you know. I had an urgent message... Yes, I'm afraid we shall have to cause you some inconvenience. This is a very serious matter. Mm-hmm, I gathered that. It, um, it involves murder, sir. Mm-hmm. It's serious. What do you want me to do? Answer some questions first, please, Major. As well as I can. Right away. Are all your men present? The Sergeant Major will know that. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir? All our people on hand, Sergeant Major. All present at Ravelli, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, they're all here, murderers included, if any. You were encamped at the superintendent's village a few nights ago. Right. He called on us. That's correct. You have one vehicle that has a bad leak in the crankcase. How do you know that? Well, I'm asking you, sir. We surely have. Our number 56... 56 of 1500 Wade Fordson. (laughs) I don't know how you know, but... We're having more trouble with this monster. And the uh, markings on this lorry? Well, the usual blue and white signals tab. And then uh, there's the section marking on the front door. What's it like, please? An ace of clubs in red and green. Ah. Oh. May we see the driver, please? Of course. Sergeant Major again. Yes, sir? Send in uh, Lance Corporal Latimer. Get him out of our palatial breakfast room, please. Yes, sir. He the... Really? Murderer? We'll see, I hope. Mild-mannered bloke can't see him murdering anyone. 
Oh, you must be wrong. You have a special laundry mark for your company, Major? <laughs> laundry mark? No, hardly in this man's army. We found one on this khaki handkerchief. Mm, might be anyone's, old chap. I have one myself. It was in the murdered boy's pocket. Boys? Oh, good Lord, gentlemen, do you... Yes? Latimer, sir. Come in, Latimer. Lance Corporal Latimer, sir. Stand easy, Latimer. What makes you jingle so, Corporal? Jingle, sir? Ring like bow bells. Oh, that's shillings, sir. I, I've got a pocket full of shillings. Excuse me, sir. Never mind, Corporal. Where did you get those shillings? Why, sir, I... Answer anything these gentlemen ask you, Latimer, that policeman. Oh. I got them from my mate, sir. Who's he? Signal or ruling, sir. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Send for ruling. Yes, sir. Thank you, Major Scott. Yeah, that's quite right. Where did he get them? I don't know, sir. Latimer, is this your handkerchief? Looks like mine, sir. May I see it, please? Yes, sir. He, here's the laundry mark they put on it when we were stationed at Leeds, sir. K201537. Yes, sir, that's mine. Where did you lose it? Lose it, sir? I didn't lose it. My pal had it. I lent it to him. Rooney? Yes, sir. Sure? Yes, sir, I'm sure. Do you always wear those steel rim glasses, Latimer? Yes, sir. Always, Wearing them when you met the lady in the M.G. the other morning? What morning, sir? When you turned off the side road onto the main road. When you were to camp before the last one. I never saw a lady up there, sir. I wasn't even out of the camp. The morning you stopped your lorry on the by road and stayed there a few minutes? I never left the camp, sir. Your lorry was out, I think. I wouldn't know, sir. I, I was working on the generator truck all day, sir. Alone, no doubt. Alone? Yes, sir. Look at this. Do you know what it is? Looks like slabs of plaster, sir. They are plaster casts of tire marks left by your lorry at, uh, at a certain place, Latimer. I don't think they could be, sir. The lorry wasn't in a certain place. What certain place? Well... Where you said, sir. You can easily prove it by comparing these cusps with your tires. Well, sir, if it if it was where you said it was, it, it wasn't me driving it. Where did I say it was? Well, I, I don't know, sir. Latimer. Uh, one moment, please, Major. Latimer, do you recognize this? Do you know what it is? No, sir. A red satchel. It was the boy's gas mask case. I never saw it before in all my life, sir. I I'll take my bloody oath to that. What boys, sir? Oh, blood. Come in. What is it, Sergeant Major? I'm sorry, sir. What? Ruling's missing, sir. I think he's gone over the hill. <laughs> Major Scott got the military police on the track of the missing signal or ruling at once. We wanted to see him badly enough, but um, Major Scott had reasons of his own. Desertion from a post in wartime is also a very serious matter. While a red cap MP lieutenant, a former Berkshire constabulary sergeant, assured the Major that they'd very soon find the adjective rascal... The superintendent and I went out to compare our plaster cast with the tires on lorry number 56. They matched perfectly. We returned to the orderly room to find the policeman gone and Major Scott sitting staring at the contents of Ruling's kit. Look here at these clothes, gentlemen. Hmm. They're soaking wet. Perhaps they were the ones he wore when... It was raining then. They could very well be, if he did it. I didn't do it. Yes, you said that, Latimer. Look, here's something on the cuff of this jacket. Well, look here. What's this? 
Uh, looks like blood. He he said he cut his hand. Did he? He didn't show me the cut, sir. Then you don't know? No, sir. What kind of chap is this man ruling, anyway? Well, he's a... He's a great husky young fella. And he, he wears steel-rimmed glasses, just like I do. He does? Sir, I, I was just thinking. What? Well, when I came back to my bivvy after working on the generator lorry all day, I, I had a look at 56. And? and? Well, she was awfully muddy. Much muddier than the other lorries that had been standing in the park all day. Could someone have taken her out without your knowing it? Could they, Latimer? Would be possible, sir. Ruling? Well, sir, he's... He's supposed to be my pal. But what? He was always drifting off, I remember. Alone. What for? Well, he... He always liked to visit people in the business, he said. What business? The business he was in before he was called up. What's he do? He was a butcher. The MPs brought signal or ruling back at three the next morning. They had found him, they said, standing in front of a... Um, you guess what kind of shop. He was quite self-possessed as he stood in Major Scott's office. Stand easy, ruling. These gentlemen want to talk to you, ruling. I say. I think they want to ask you some questions. First, we want to search this man, Major. Go ahead. I'll look at your wallet first, ruling. I say. Not much in it. There. We'll see. Yes, sir. I opened the wallet. There was nothing in it at all. Nothing except a torn one-pound note. Give me the torn piece of Philip's pound note, I said to the superintendent. That was all. It fitted perfectly. Let me do it. Lewis Ruling. I arrest you for the willful murder of Philip Ainsley Avery. I say. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Ah, I'm not afraid to tell you about it, sir. I killed poor little beggar. He said he was running away to join army. I laughed at him. And he told me he had plenty of money. And I asked him where he kept it. He said in his respirator case, and I reached for it, and he yelled. Just like one of them little lambs when you've got it by it, neck. <laughs> and I got mad. And he jumped out of lorry, and I after him, and he turned to yell at me, and I hit him with a spanner, just like a cute little lamb. And then he fell down. And I did what you always do to a lamb when you kill it. Lewis Rowling was tried and found guilty of the murder of the poor little lamb. But his counsel appealed on the grounds of insanity. And he was adjudged mentally irresponsible. He was committed to an institution for the criminal insane. And died there more than a year ago. You have heard another authentic story from the files of Scotland Yard on Whitehall 1212. Research is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today...